Hollywood, California, Monday, December 28th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Herbert Marshall and Madeline Carroll in Cavalcade with Uno O'Connor, David Niven, and Douglas Scott. <laughs> Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Herbert Marshall, Madeline Carroll, Una O'Connor, David Niven, Elsa Buchanan, and Douglas Scott. Our guest, Noel Coward, author of Cavalcade. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. With this exceptional array of brilliant personalities, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap welcome you to another gala event in the Lux Radio Theater. Don't let cosmetic skin bar your road to romance. The active lather of Lux Toilet Soap removes staled cosmetics and all impurities that choke the pores, leaving your complexion smooth, soft, and lovely. Yes, nine out of ten Hollywood stars prefer Lux Toilet Soap. But you can use it, too, every day. For this pure white soap costs only a few cents. Give your skin the care it deserves. Buy a few cakes tomorrow. And now, our producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. On time's eternal stage where scenes are marked by passing years, another curtain soon will fall. With Cavalcade, the Lux Radio Theater says farewell to 1936. A play, I think, that not only crowns a year of what we hope were notable productions, but sets a standard we shall strive to meet through 1937. As we turn to England for our story, so we turn to England for our stars. Herbert Marshall, Madeline Carroll, both natives of the mighty little island. Herbert Marshall turned actor by circumstances, for he began his career as a bookkeeper. After a year and a half of debits and credits, he was discharged. Needing a job, he became assistant manager and then actor in a musical comedy company. Today, he is not only well known on the screen, but on the legitimate stages of the world. Madeline Carroll, daughter of an Irish professor and French mother, became a school teacher to earn money enough to take her to London and the stage. Oddly enough, Madeline's first Hollywood offer was to play in Cavalcade, but she refused it to remain in England with her husband, Captain Philip Astley. She came here, however, two years ago, lending her distinction, beauty, and ability to the case against Mrs. Ames, the general died at dawn, and Lloyds of London. Tonight, she becomes Jane Marriott and Mr. Marshall Robert Marriott. Una O'Connor will be heard as Ellen, the same role she played in the film and on the London stage. David Niven, seen currently in Dodsworth and Beloved Enemy, is Edward Marriott. And the part of Edward as a boy is played by Douglas Scott, who is seen as Horatio Nelson in Lloyd's of London. Our play is by Noel Coward, the third drama from the nimble pen of this amazing writer, producer, and actor to be performed in our theater in less than a year. So on with the play. The Lux Radio Theater presents Herbert Marshall and Madeline Carroll in Cavalcade. <laughs> December 31st, 1899. Despite the Boer War, then raging in South Africa, all England celebrated the most momentous New Year's Eve in modern history, the turn of the 20th century, the beginning of a new era. In a charmingly furnished drawing room of a house in London, Ellen, the maid, is setting the table for a light supper. As she turns to the door, her husband, the butler, enters, carrying a bottle of champagne. Did the master say they'd have champagne two bridges? It's a celebration, ain't it? And it wouldn't be a celebration without champagne, would it? There's hot punch. It's wiser to be on the safe side, is my way, Ellen. If hot punch fills the bill, they have hot punch. If it's champagne, it's here, too. I was cook when you come up. Flighty. 
running around the kitchen like a cat on a griddle. New Year's Eve's gone to her head and no mistake. She's been queer all day. Has she ever been quite right? Less than an hour ago, she told me she feels like it was the end of everything. Oh, so do I, for that matter. Oh, come, come now, Ellen. It ain't necessary to start that all over again. Oh, well, you ain't losing a husband. Oh, you ain't losing me, Ellen. A man's marching off to war ain't staying home with his loved ones, is it? Well, no, not exactly. Oh, it's horrible, Bridges. I can't bear to think what it's going to be like when you're gone. Then don't think about it. Well, I can't help thinking. It's a bad <laughs> habit, Ellen. You ain't no different from the missus. Master Robert's going to, you know. You're in the same boat as all the other soldiers' wives. But you ain't cut out to be a soldier. Ellen. Well, what's going to happen to me and Fanny if anything happens to you? Oh, you'll <laughs> carry on. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, girl, you married me for better than worse, didn't you? Oh, I did, but... Well, if it turns out for worse, so much the worse it'll be. And if it turns out for better... Hmm, fat lot of comfort, that is. And what's the war for, anyhow? We've got to have wars every now and then to prove we're top dog. <laughs> this one don't seem to be proving much. How can you tell what our brave boys are suffering out there in darkest Africa? Giving their life's blood for their queen and country. Oh, if this wasn't New Year's Eve, I'd lose my temper, and that's a fact. Well, it wouldn't be the first time. You'd better go and get the off punch. They'll be here in a minute. Oh, listen, there they are now. Draw the curtains. Why, it's almost New Year's. At least they wants to be cheery. Yeah, hurry up now. Go on. Get the off punch. You mark my words, Ellen. If we didn't give them boys a lesson, they'd be over here wreaking havoc and carnage before you could say Jack Robinson. I'll get along with you. Good evening, Bridget. Your cloak, ma'am? Thank you. Your coat, hat, and stick, sir? Here you are. Very good, sir. May I have the honor to wish you both a very, very happy New Year? Thank you, Bridget. Same to you. Ellen, how nice the table looks. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Where did those flowers come from? They're from me and Bridget's, ma'am. With our very best wishes, I'm sure. That was sweet of you, Ellen. Oh, not at all, ma'am. Well, it's a pleasure indeed. Well, I'll go and help Bridget's with the off punch, ma'am. It was sweet of them, Robert. I feel I want to cry. Well, then by all means cry, dearest. This evening was planned sentimentally. To say hail and farewell. It isn't farewell yet. Soon, Robert. Dreadfully soon. When it comes, then we'll take it. You look so beautiful at dinner, Jane. I'm glad. You're beautiful now. Oh, I expect it's only that dress, really. Dresses can be very deceiving, darling. Of course. That's perhaps how we wear them. And that ornament in your hair? Yes. And the fact that I love you so dearly. You might be hideous and ill-dispositioned and tedious, and I would never know it. You're a darling. And I'm going to believe every word you say, even though I know I shouldn't. Kiss me, Robert. Sweetheart. A goodbye to the old year. I wonder if the boys are asleep. Snoring, I expect. Oh, no, Robert, not snoring. They both have perfect tonsils. Dr. Harrison said so. Inherited from their mother, my dear. Oh, Robert, why must you leave me? It takes men to fight wars. What does it matter about the boars? It matters about your brother Jim, doesn't it? He's out there. That counts. Yes. Give my love to him if you ever see him. If he's alive. Of course he's alive. They're all alive. They're bound to be relieved soon. Baden Powell's a fine man. How long will it last? The war, I mean. A few months. God willing. In a few hours you'll be sailing. You'll be going on board. Perhaps it'll be all over when you get there. Perhaps. I suppose you'd hate that, Robert. Bitterly. Edward and Joel want to see you off. No. No, they'd better be here. They're your sons. No, they're, they're children. They'd better be here. It's rather horrid even thinking about it, isn't it? Thank heaven for one thing. They won't have to fight. Peace and happiness for them. Oh, please, God. Peace and happiness for them. Always. <laughs> A new year. It started, sir, just 12 o'clock. Happy New Year to you both, Mum. Bridges, open the windows. Come over here, Ellen. Stay and drink with us. What, me, sir? Fill four glasses, Bridges. Champagne. Make it champagne. We'll be toasting the new year and all it means to us. 
the new year. Here we are. Now, raise your glasses. Jane, Ellen, Bridges, 1900. 1900. 1900. Listen. What is it? The children. I thought I heard. I'd better go up and see. It sounded like Master Joe. Bring them down here, Jane. Bring them both down. How very impolite of the 20th century to waken the children. Well, I think I'd better be getting aboard. Yes. We're almost ready to sail, I imagine. Yes. It's come at last, hasn't it, Robert? This moment. You'll be very brave, darling, won't you? I'll try to be. Take care of yourself, my dearest. I shall probably be seasick. Lie down flat on every possible occasion. I'll try to remember. Bridges will look after you. Perhaps you'll be lying down flat, too. And, and you mustn't worry about me being unhappy when you've gone. I'm going to keep myself very busy. I shan't give myself time to think of anything. Except that I'm so proud. So proud of you, darling. I'll write and telegraph whenever it's possible. Please do. Well? This... This is horrid, isn't it? I really must go. Not just for a minute. Jane. Yes, Robert? I'm going to kiss you once more. And then I want you to turn away. Turn away and go right on talking. So you won't actually see me leave you. Very well, my darling. Now, Jane. Edward and Joe were terribly anxious to come, but I'm glad I didn't bring them, really. Joe gets overexcited so easily. He's had a very bad cold, anyhow. Edward could have come, I suppose, but, but that would have upset Joe so dreadfully. Being left alone. <laughs> Take care of yourself, my own dear. You're not here anymore, so, so I can break down a little. I felt you go when I said about Joe being overexcited. Robert. Robert. First four months of the new century. Four months of fighting and bloodshed. In the beleaguered city of Mafeking in South Africa, the British troops fight desperately, hoping for relief. It's the morning of May the 18th, 1900. All England waits for news. Bing, 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 bing. There, Edward. How many boars did I kill that time? Twenty-seven. Set them up again, Cousin Edith. This one's got his leg knocked off. <clears throat> then he's wounded. You've got to put him back in the box. I wonder how many boars father has killed, Edward. Oh, hundreds, I expect. I wish these were real boars instead of tin ones. Bang, bang, bang. Dirty old Kruger. Bang. Shut up, Joe. How dare you fire without orders? Excuse me, sir. There, that is very much more like it. Put your army up again, will you, Cousin Edith? Edward. Well, what is it? Need I always be the boars? Yes. Why? Because you're only a girl. Watch out. Bang, bang, bang. I'll teach you, you mean little pig. I have a cannon of my own, even though I am a boar. Bang, bang, bang. How do you like that? Bang. Take the old cannon. Don't throw it at Joe. I'll smash all of his soldiers. It's not fair. Stop walking or lose the nice soldiers. Edith, that was cheating. I'm sick of being the boars. I'll never be the boars again so long as I live. I won't be the boars. Edith. I won't be. Children, why on earth are you making such an awful noise? Aunt Margaret and I can hear you right down the hall. It's Edith's mother. What's the matter with Edith? She doesn't like being the boars, Aunt Margaret. She's mutinous. I mm. don't blame her. Bang, bang, bang. Here's your cannon thrown back. Oh, Joe! Oh, oh. Joe, you're a naughty, wicked little boy. You go upstairs this minute. I only meant... Upstairs. <laughs> but, Mother, men fight. I don't see why I can't. Come over here, Edith, and stop crying. He hit my knee with his cannon. We she got angry because we killed her soldier. Oh, stop it, stop it, stop it. Can't you play any other game but soldiers? Soldiers? Soldiers hurting each other, killing each other? Go away from me, go away! Jane, don't. Run along now, all of you. I'm sorry, Mum. It's all right. 
Run upstairs, dear. Yes, Mom. Come on, Cousin Edith. Come on, Joe. I'm sorry, Cousin Edith. I didn't mean to hurt you. Jane, I'm all right. It, it's just nerves. Listen, soldiers of the Queen. There's no escape from it anywhere, is there? Shall I throw them some money and ask them to go away? I don't care. If it isn't them, it'll be somebody else. Oh, Margaret, will these days ever end? Robert said it'd be only a little while and then it'd be all over. That was nearly four months ago. News will come soon. You must have courage, Jane. I don't believe I shall ever see Robert again. Be brave, dear. It's much easier to be brave when there's something to hear, something definite. I can't go on smiling through long, dragging weeks. I can't do it, Margaret. You're not in it alone, Jane. But two people I love best in all the world down there suffering. I don't hear a word. It's dreadful. Madigan is bound to be relieved within the next few days. And then it's all over. All the papers say so. That's what they've said for months. But they're dying down there. Please, dear. Dying. I can't bear to think of it, and yet I can't stop thinking. I can see it at night. Come in. Pardon me, Mama. I just thought that some nice old tea... Splendid, Ellen. Tea does help, Mum. Has, has any news come? Not yet, Ellen. No news. None. We've been standing outside the war office for hours. Then we went to Fleet Street to the newspaper offices. Well, here's a nice cup of tea, Mum. That'll make you feel better. Thank you, Ellen. Well, there ain't no cause to worry about the master, Mum. He's all right. He's got my bridges with him. And if anything happened to either of them, we'd be bound to hear from one of them, if you know what I mean. You must be fearfully worried, too, Ellen. Oh, well, on and off I am, but I says to myself that... No news is good news, and what must be, must be. You'd never believe how that cheers me up, Mum. Helen, find out what the news is. Yes, Mum. It's about Mavicking. Oh, Margaret. Wait a minute. Boy, wait, wait. There's Ellen. She's down there. She's speaking to him. Ellen, what news? Are the lips of the wounded? Ellen, what is it? Nothing but what we've been hearing, Mum. Nothing. Always the same. Jane. Yes? You're going to rest. Rest? How can I? Then we're both going out. Out? I'm going now. I shall be back at a quarter to seven. Why? We're going to dine at the Cafe Royal, Jane. And then go to the theater. I couldn't. You could and you will, Jane. It's senseless sitting at home by yourself, fretting and worrying. It doesn't do any good. Robert wouldn't want you to. What you need is life and music. I can go. You are going. Suggest you, Jane. You've got to make it. Be ready at a quarter to seven. I'll be here. Margaret, wait! A gesture for men who are dying. Keep on. Go on playing. Play louder. Soldiers of the Queen, wounded and dying and suffering for the Queen. Play louder, play louder, play louder! I say, come here, please. Our glasses are empty. Directly, sir. Yes, sir. Jane, darling, brace up. Yes. This is a party, isn't it? Of course. Let your mood fit your gown. You are beautiful, Jane. Robert said the same thing New Year's Eve. He said he'd be back soon. I... I slept after you left me this afternoon. Splendid. I dreamed. Only it wasn't as if it were a dream. It was so real that I... Margaret. Yes, Jane? I saw Robert. I was with him, Margaret. I don't know where it was. I couldn't tell somehow. It was a place I'd never been before. Lovely, peaceful. And Robert was there. Come now, drink your wine. Robert spoke to me, tossed his hat aside and came running to me as if he were a boy, like Joe or Edward. He laughed, called as he came running. He called me by name. Jane... Oh, Robert, you're safe. Why, of course I am. Jim, how is he? As right as man can be. Let me look at you, darling. Oh, sweetheart. You look so tired. You haven't been worrying about me, have you? No, not too much. <laughs> oh, you were never a good liar. <laughs> I'm glad of that, though. Not to miss me. Not to care. Too much. Oh, I've missed you so, dear. But you're here, and you're... Robert! 
What's wrong, dear? Your left arm. It's, it's all right, Jane. It's gone. I, I do nicely without it. It was just fooling about with some youngsters. We were making believe war. Oh. One of them became furious when I called her a boar. He threw a cannon at me. Not so sporting, I thought. But it wasn't an arm, Robert. It was the knee. Was it? Oh, very well. What's the difference? We'll stop playing before long. We will settle down at home. Drink a toast to the queen. Robert. I saw Jim. Sent his love. Be back home before long. Robert. Wait for me. Robert. I know what that dream means. Shadows. Jane, dear, don't be absurd. My arm coming back, Margaret. Wars will go on forever. Boys will grow and become men. And because it's man's task to prove we're the master. Jane, what are you saying? Bridget was right. He told Ellie the truth. We must prove we're top dog. Men must be born and live, die. What was that? Quiet. Quiet, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we have news from the front. Matthew King has been relieved. <laughs> Let it be true. Our Lux Radio Theater production this evening is a cavalcade indeed. From Hollywood, the procession is headed by Herbert Marshall and Madeline Carroll. In New York, they are joined by the brilliant author of our play, Noel Coward. Famous in London and on Broadway as an actor, dancer, singer, composer, producer, and playwright. Mr. Coward outdoes himself this year by offering and acting in nine one-act plays entitled Tonight at 8.30. We switch you now from Hollywood to the Star's Dressing Room at the National Theater in New York City. We can have our distinguished guest for only a moment. His own audience is still applauding his first play, and he must change his costume for the next but here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Noel Coward. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I am more honored than I can tell you, not only by your very kind words of praise, but by your having selected three of my plays for production in your Lux Radio Theater. All this tribute is too much, and you're taking an unfair advantage in delivering it from behind the protection of the Rocky Mountains. Yes, I have been active in the theater for many years, but this is the first time I've ever played two theaters all in one brief evening. I'm enjoying the experience very much. I would like you to know how fine I think the Lux Radio Theater is. And I'm particularly happy that I can salute my friends, Herbert Marshall, Madeleine Carroll, and Una O'Connor. This last, a very old friend to Cavalcade, as she created the part of Ellen in the original production. And I consider them perfectly cast in the principal roles. Many people have ascribed all sorts of motives to the writing of Cavalcade. Motives patriotic, political, and financial. Some people make a career of motive discovery. They search every word for a clue, like old ladies peering under the bed for burglars. The real story behind Cavalcade is very different. All my life I had wanted to do a big play on a big scale. I had considered all periods and episodes... And one day, I happened to pick up a back issue of the Illustrated London News. In it was a picture of a troop ship leaving for the Boer War. The whole scheme seemed to take form in my mind, then and there. I made some tentative arrangements, but then I had to go off to America to play private lives. All of a sudden, early in April, Charles B. Cochrane wired me from London. I had to set an opening date for Cavalcade in order to get Drury Lane Theatre. So I took a chance for the end of September... There I was, no play, no cast, no costumes or set, just an opening date. But we finally succeeded in opening the show just two weeks after the original date. Then came the critics. One of the most amusing remarks was the reference to the press to my canny, shrewd political sense. A strong patriotic play just two weeks before the general election. The truth is that I'd been so busy I had completely forgotten that there was to be an election at all. People have asked me, what parts of Cavalcade I like best. My own choice is Queen Victoria's funeral scene, 
and the outbreak of the war in 1914. Tonight, we are all approaching another New Year's Eve. The first scene of Cavalcade, you remember, was on that same occasion. The last scene also takes place on New Year's Eve. At the close of that scene, a toast is proposed to England. As you hear it tonight, I should like you to feel that I am, a, I am proposing a toast to each of you and to your country. Thank you, Mr. Coward. We're back in Hollywood now, and Cavalcade goes forward, starring Herbert Marshall as Robert Marriott, Madeline Carroll as Jane Marriott, and featuring Una O'Connor, David Niven, and Douglas Scott. <laughs> January, in the year 1901, Matt's King has been relieved, and the soldiers of Queen Victoria start back to England and home. Robert Marriott and the butler Bridges were among the first to return. In the basement kitchen of the Marriott home, Bridges enters. He waves a newspaper excitedly. Helen Cook, come here quick, quick. And what's the matter, Mr. Bridges? Look here, the newspaper. Oh, don't yell so, Bridges. It can't be anything to concern us. Ellie, how can you say that? It concerns the old country. Look here, the Queen. It says she's sinking. What? The Queen? There, now, I told you so. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, she's very old, isn't she? Old? What's that got to do with it? Well, and I've never seen her, have I? I have. Driving along Birdcage Walk once, years ago. England won't be the same place without the Queen. The procession! It's coming, Mother! Quiet, Edward. Stand back a little from the window. Let Bridges and Ellen see, too. Can you see, Ellen? Oh, thank you, Mum. I can see. Oh, the Queen... Oh, God bless her. Easy, girl. Easy now. Look, Mum. There's Father. There's Father down there in the procession. Shh. Be quiet, darling. They're passing now. Stand absolutely still. To attention. Like your father showed you. Yes, Mum. Five kings riding behind her. Mum. She must have been a very little lady. The death of Queen Victoria signaled the passing of the old order. Times and customs changed, and the 20th century gathered speed with the dawn of each new day. But Robert, Robert, are you sure they're safe? Safe? What, Nanny? Those, what did you call them? Those automobiles. Oh, I imagine they're safe enough. But don't worry, I won't buy one yet for a while. Here, you better hurry and get dressed. We haven't much time. I'm almost done. How's my gown? Lovely, darling. And the train? If any lady at the court has one more perfect, I shall throw up my hands. <laughs> I shall probably throw them up anyway. I'm not very fond of these formal affairs, my dear. They make me nervous. Oh, Robert, don't be silly. Well, I mean it. The going was far less difficult for those fellows in Africa, really. Don't talk about that. Please. Now, now, what's the matter? I'm happy tonight, Robert. I want to stay happy. War isn't happiness. All oh, right. Our son, Joe and Edward. If war ever came again and took them... It's not going to take them. Have a look at my tie, will you, darling? Of course. I'm sorry, Robert. That's all right. Well, am I dressed up to please you? You're perfect. Except, where's your Victoria Cross? Oh. Oh, here we are. Wait, I'll put it on for you. Some men are brave enough to win the VC, but I've yet to meet one who knows how to wear it. There. Oh, I'm so proud of you, Robert. I mean, Sir Robert. We've come a long way, Lady Jane. A very long way. And in such a few years, it frightens me sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything's so different, Robert. You're happy, aren't you? Of course, darling. And yet, oh, haven't you ever ached right down inside for, well, for the other days? Before the war? If you want. Yes, I think I have. 
Things are different. Things have changed. But it isn't only us. It's the whole world. It's all England. There's a new spirit to things, a new thought, a new philosophy of existence. I don't know exactly what it is. I don't even know that I care for it. But it's there. Well... I sometimes wonder if we weren't just as happy then in a small house with just Ellen and Bridges. Oh, good old Bridges. I miss them, Robert. I miss Ellen. We must run down and see them sometime. They opened a pub, you know, after they left us. A pub? You mean a bar room? Of course. Didn't I tell you? Bridges wrote me all about it. A pub. They've changed, too. No, Bridges. He couldn't. He'll be the same Bridges till the day he dies. I hope so. I don't know. She dances beautifully, Ellen. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Bridges and me has been giving her lessons now for two years. Very talented, if you ask me. Uh, thank you, Sir Robert. Come here, Fanny. Yes, sir. I don't suppose you remember me. You were just a baby when I knew you. Yes, sir. Mama's told me how we used to live at your house. Me you now. That's enough. Now go and sit down, Fanny. Yes, Mother. I hear Master Robert is at Oxford College, my lady. Yes. Mad about it, too. You must come and see us sometime when he's down on vacation, Ellen. Oh, thank you, Mum. Hello, Ellen. Oh, hello, George. I've got the missus with me. Oh, I didn't know you had company. Oh, please stay. Don't go on our account. Oh, come in, Flo. We just dropped by, Ellen. We didn't know you had. Uh, this is Mr. and Mrs. George Snapper, my lady. Sir Robert and Lady Marriott. Oh. Oh, yeah, oh how do you do? Oh, sit, sit down, Joe. Sit down, sit down, George. Well, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, a nice day out, Sir Robert. Yes, yes, it's really spring now. Uh, uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> By the way, Ellen, I'm, I'm sorry to hear Bridges is ill. Bridges ill? What's wrong with him, Ellen? Well, before you and Flo come, George, I was explaining to her ladyship and Sir Robert about poor Bridges' bad leg. We were so sorry to hear about it. Bad leg? Ellen explained that he's been in horrible agony ever since Sunday. Where is he? Hey, stop taking down my shoes. Uh, where is he, Ellen? Upstairs in bed. Oh, I'll pop up and see him. He's asleep now. Well, my eye. By the way, Ellen... You didn't tell us how he came to have the accident. Oh, well, he, he was cycling, Sir Robert. He, he was cycling and he fell off. I didn't know he had a cycle. He hasn't any more. Will you tell him how sorry we were not to, not to have seen him? Yes, Sir Robert, I'll do that. Goodbye, Ellen. Oh, it was so kind of you, Mum, to come all the way down here to see us and to bring Fanny that lovely doll and everything. I wanted to see you. Goodbye, Mrs. Snapper. Happy to have met you, I'm sure. Goodbye, Mr. Snapper. Uh, goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Ellen. Goodbye, Ellen, again. Don't fail to remember me to Bridges. We miss you both. It seems as if it were only yesterday that you were with us. We miss you too, ma'am. Time changes many things, but it can't change old friends, can it? Oh, no, ma'am. No. There's some things that... Yeah. Yeah, what's going on here? Oh, my Lord. My eye. Bridges. I thought you was in bed. Bed? Who said anything about bed? Oh, you better go back, Bridges. Oh, remember your leg, dear. Ain't nothing wrong with my leg. Oh, Bridges. Oh, so you're why she was trying to get me out of the way. Hello, Bridges. Pleased to meet you again, Sir Robert. Welcome to our arbor. <laughs> I, I, I think we better go, Jane. Oh, sir, that's how it stands. I see. Proud and haughty, are we? Oh, Bridget, stop it. No, please, stop it. No. Ellen, I'm so sorry. And I quite understand. Please don't be upset. And let me come and see you again. Come along, dear. Come along, dear. Come along. Who does he think he is? Oh, you drunken brute. Shut your mouth. You mind yours and I'll mind mine. Look here, old man. You better come up and have a lie down. Take your paw off my arm. Lot of snobs, that's what. Lot of bloody snobs. I'm not good enough to be home when the quality comes. I'll see who's good enough. Who oh, give Fanny that doll? Her noble ladyship. Oh, you let it alone. I'll look after the truck quality brings to my home. I'll look after them, I will. I'll hand it right back to him. George! I'll go and fetch him. Don't worry. He's a bit woozy, that's oh, all. He's gone down the street. He may go up to their home. I'll oh, stop him. George, let him go. Uh, Bridges, come back here, you blind Mind man. your own business. Come back out of the street. 
There's a bus making towards you. I'm not good enough for him. Don't stand. Look out. I'll show him who he is. The 20th century swings into its second decade, March 1912. I say, Father. Yes, Edward? Father, are you going to sit up all night? I hope not. Are you? No, sir. I... Well, I'm, I'm You're just... just sitting up waiting for Joe, aren't you, Edward? Yes, sir. So am I. Where is he? I don't know, sir. Sure? He said he was going out tonight, so that's all I know. And he said he'd be back early. Mm, three o'clock, that's early enough. I suppose you're going to play the Good Samaritan again? Help him up to bed? Well, Father, I... You've done it before quite a few times. Or did you think I didn't know? Well, Father, don't be rough with him. Joe's just a kid. He doesn't know what it's all about. He's all right. Of course he is. That's why I want to speak to him. By the way, how's Edith? Oh, very well. Huh. Except for date yet? Yes, sir, it's the seventh. Good. She's a splendid girl, Edith. You're sailing to America on your honeymoon, eh? If Edith wants to. Now, uh, about Joe, Father. Oh, well, that must be Joe now. I imagine so. You won't stay, will you? Well, no, sir, that is not unless you... Thanks, Edward. I say, Edward, is everything clear? Yes, quite clear, Joe. Come in. Oh, oh, I say, Father, I didn't know that you were downstairs. It's all right. How are you, Joe? I? Oh, I'm quite well, thanks. But I, I think I'll say good night. Yes, good night, old man. Sit down, Joe. Have a good time? Tonight? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Splendid. I, I was out with some of the lads. We did the town a bit. You know how it is. Of course, of course. I used to go out with the lads myself. Oh, we had some gay old times. Used to stay out till all hours. Really? Yes. Once in a while. Oh. You fellows go a good deal faster than we did, of course. Things will speed it up so. Only the other night, your mother and I went to a restaurant out of the theater. First time I'd been for years. There were a lot of young people there. I was quite surprised. Surprised? Hmm, the way they were carrying on. Oh, I wasn't shocked or anything like that, but... It, it was so different... So utterly different from anything I'd ever known. It was unhealthy somehow. There was a young fellow off in the corner with a party. A fellow about, uh, about your age, Joe. He had a girl with him. Very pretty girl, too. But they'd both been drinking quite a lot. It wasn't a very pleasant sight. Luckily... Your mother had her back to them. But I didn't want to take any chances. I took her out of the place. On the way home, I got to thinking. I thought, I'm glad that boy wasn't Joe. If it had been Joe, it would have hurt horribly. What, what restaurant was it, sir? Cafe Royal. I see. Ever been there, Joe? Yes, sir. You say that... You took Mother out? That's right. She... she didn't see? No. Well, good night, Joe. Good night, sir. See you in the morning. Yes, sir. And Father? Well? Thank you for taking Mother out. April the 14th, 1912. On the high seas off Newfoundland. Yes, Edward? Darling, stand here close to the rail. Oh, it's glorious. But it's too big, the Atlantic, isn't it? Far too big. And too deep. Much, much too deep. I don't care a bit, do you? <laughs> Not a scrap. Wouldn't it be awful if a magician came to us and said, unless you count accurately every single fish in the Atlantic, you'll die tonight? And we should die tonight. 
How much would you mind dying, I mean? I don't know, really. A good deal, I expect. I don't believe I should mind so very much now. You see, we could never in our whole lives be happier than we are now, could we? Well, darling, there are different sorts of happiness. This is the best sort. Oh, sweetheart. Don't, darling. We don't want any more of the stewards to know we're on our honeymoon. Why not? Most of them have forgotten what a honeymoon's like. Did you ever think when we were children, going to the pantomime and going to the zoo and playing soldiers, that we should ever be married? Of course I didn't. Was I a nice child? Horrible. So were you. So was Joe. Vile. You always used to take sides against me. And yet we all liked one another, really. I think I liked Joe better than you. But then he was younger and easier to manage. <laughs> He was awfully funny at the wedding, wasn't he? Yes, he has no reverence, I'm afraid. Absolutely none. He's passing gallantly through the chorus girl phase now, isn't he? Yeah, gallantly, but not quickly. You had uh, several love affairs before you married me, didn't you? <clears throat> right of my life, please shut up. You'd be awfully cross if I'd had, wouldn't you? Did you? Hundreds. <laughs> Liar. Oh. I rather wish I had, really. Perhaps I should have learned some tricks to hold you with when you begin to get tired of me. Oh, I never shall, darling. Oh, yes, you will. One day. The loveliness we feel now will fade and the guilt wear off the gingerbread. Tell me, have you ever seen gingerbread with guilt on it? Never. <laughs> then that's settled. Mm -hmm. Anyway, look at father and mother. They're perfectly happy. They had a better chance at the beginning. Things weren't changing so swiftly. Life wasn't so restless. How long do you give us? I don't know. I don't care. This is our moment, Edward. Complete and heavenly. This is our own. Forever. Wireless message for you, sir. Oh, thank you, Stuart. I'll take it here. A wireless message for us? Nobody else, darling. Look here. Mr. and Mrs. Edward Marriott. On board the steamship Titanic. Century speeds on, on to a climax of love and hate, of fire and blood, of steel against steel. August the 4th, 1914. Robert, help me off with these dust sheets. We'll get a woman in tomorrow and clean up. All right, dear. I shall never go on a holiday again, ever. It's horrid when you're there, and it's much worse when you come back. Still, it is better to be here in London, Jane, if anything's going to happen. It's going to happen all right. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it now. Oh, it, it's so hot I can't breathe, Robert. Hello, Mother. Oh, Joe, darling. It's grand to see you back. How are you, Father? Fine, thanks. Cigarette? Uh, no, son, no. They're pretty exciting, all the things that are happening, aren't they? Yes. Rather like Germans, don't you? Enormously. There is the war. How long do you think it will last? Three months of the outside. I suppose we shall win, shan't we? Robert. What's wrong, dear? I'm going upstairs for a minute. I shan't be long. All right, darling. I say, the war might last for six months, don't you think? Oh, impossible. Have you any idea, Joe, what a war costs in actual money? I suppose quite a lot. Yes. And the Germans can afford it even less than we can. Are you glad you left the army or sorry? Absolutely delighted. Will you go back again? <laughs> I expect so. I'll go, too. You want to? Terribly. Why? I don't know. I just want to. I wish Edward was still here. We could have started off together. Now, don't be too impulsive, Joe. Think of your mother. Think of me. You're all we have left now. Piper, war declared against Germany. Listen. Piper, Father, do you hear? Piper, Robert, Robert, what is it? England is at war, my dear. War. Oh. It's, it's hot, isn't it? Don't look so sad, Mum. It won't last long. I say, Father, we ought to have some wine. We must drink to this. <laughs> We've only hot. We'll have to drink to the downfall of Germany in her own wine. Here, here. Edward missed this. 
I'm glad. Jane. He died when he was happy, before the world broke over his head. Don't say that, Jane. We've had wars before without the world breaking. Drink to war, then, if you want. I'm not going to. I can't. Rule Britannia. Send us victorious, happy and glorious. Drink, Joey. You're only a baby still, but you're old enough for war. Drink like the Germans are drinking. To victory and defeat. And stupid, tragic sorrow. Believe me out of it. for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Herbert Marshall, Madeline Carroll, and our all-star cast will be back in the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Cavalcade shortly. For the moment, let's drop in at Universal Studios. It's after closing time for Sally B., secretary to a famous producer. But Sally won't go home. She's still hoping for that invitation out on New Year's Eve. The telephone rings. She picks up the receiver, hopefully. Hello, yes. Oh, hello, Alice. I thought it might be somebody else. New Year's Eve? Hmm. Guess I'll go to bed. What? Oh, no, I have something to wear. Just remade my old blue velvet. Well, I can't dance alone, can I? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. But it does seem everybody's going out but me. Oh, I'm not bitter. You'd be fed up, too. What are you driving at? Oh, don't be silly, Alice. If you have something to say, say it. Complexion? What about it? And now on the other end of the wire, Alice is telling Sally, and truthfully so, that a girl is out of the picture where men are concerned unless her complexion is lovely. Important to guard against cosmetic skin. Its dullness, tiny blemishes, enlarging pores spoil good looks. Ruin your chances for romance. Begin the new year right. Use for your complexion the care screen stars use. Lux toilet soap. Its active lather removes dust and dirt, stale rouge and powder thoroughly. Prevents the pore choking that causes cosmetic skin. You can use powder and rouge as much as you like. But before you put on fresh makeup, always before you go to bed, remove your stale makeup the Lux Toilet Soap way. This year, Lux Toilet Soap has kept many thousands of complexions lovely. Next year, let your complexion grow soft and smooth with this gentle care. Remember, nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. Once again, Mr. DeMille. Cavalcade continues, starring Herbert Marshall, Madeline Carroll, with Una O'Connor, David Nevin, and Douglas Scott. Time swings in its orbit. Men battle, men die. The whole world roars in chaos. Once more, we're in the Marriott drawing room. It's the morning of November 11th, 1918. Ellen has just entered. Jane goes to her with outstretched hands. Ellen, oh, I am glad to see you. I couldn't believe my eyes when you first walked in. Sit down. I just thought I'd call, madam. I'm glad you did. So glad. These are lonely days, aren't they, Ellen? My call's rather important, as a matter of fact. How's Fanny? Oh, very well. I'm never going to forget how she danced the last time we saw her. She's dancing in over the moon now, you know. Yes, I went the other night. She was splendid. I felt very proud to know her. It's about her I've come to see you. Is anything wrong? Well, no. <coughs> Not exactly. What is it? About her and uh, Joe. Joe? Yes. I don't understand, Ellen. Well, they've been... Uh, <coughs> they've been uh, what you might call in love. <coughs> yes. My Joe? Yes, your Joe. His last two leaves. He spent a lot of time with Fanny. Oh, I see. I wouldn't come to see about it at all, only... Uh, well, now that the war's over, or almost over, that is, and he'd be coming home, I thought that... What did you think? Well, I thought they ought to get married. Does Fanny want to marry him? Oh, I haven't talked to her about it. She doesn't know, I know. And how do you know? I found a letter he wrote. And you read it? Of course. I brought it with me. I knew you'd want to see it. I do not wish to read it. Oh, well, I see. I think we'd better let the whole thing stand until Joe comes home. Then he and Fanny can decide what they wish to do. Oh, I didn't wish to, wish to upset you. I'm not in the least upset. It's been on my mind. But you didn't tell Fanny before you came here. I think I know why. 
In any case, I never interfere with my son's affairs. Well, sure, I'm very sorry. That's all. Goodbye, Ellen. I suppose you imagine that my daughter isn't good enough to marry your son. Well, if that's the case, I can assure you that you're very much mistaken. Fanny's received everywhere. She knows all the best people. How nice for her. I wish I did. Oh, things aren't what they used to be, you know. Oh, no. It's all changing. Yes, I see it is. Fanny's at the top of the tree now. Well, she's up in the most wonderful office. Oh, Ellen. What is it? I'm so sorry, so sorry. <laughs> Don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do, inside. You must understand, Ellen. Something seems to have gone out of all of us. Goodbye, Ellen. Your pardon, my lady. Yes? What is it, Belden? A telegram. Thank you. It's all over, my lady. The war's over. It's 11 o'clock. My lady. There's, there's no answer, Belden. No answer. My lady, is anything wrong? Oh, ma'am. Oh, quick, what's happened? What, what, what's in that telegram? You needn't worry about Fanny and Joe, Ellen. He won't be able to come back anymore. Because he's dead. Dead? Oh, God. Oh, dear God. Eighteen more years roll by. December the 31st, 1936. Jane, dear. Oh, yes, Robert. Were you asleep? No, dear. I was just sitting here, thinking, and watching the crowds go by in the street. Did Franklin bring the champagne up? There it is, by the table. Good. Well, Robert, here we go again. I believe you'll laugh at me inside for my annual sentimental outburst. No, dear. I don't laugh at you. One more year behind us. One more year before us. Do you mind? Oh, no. Everything passes. Even time. It seems incredible, doesn't it? Here we are in this same room. Yes. I've hated it for years. Do you want to move? Of course not. We might have some new curtains. We have, dear. And I never noticed. They've only been up a week. They look very nice. Robert, what toast have you in mind for tonight? Something gay and original, I hope. Just our old friend, the future. The future of England. Quick, it's starting. The champagne. Hurry. I can't get the thing open. Let me try. There it is. Here, Jane. First of all, my dear, I drink to you. Loyal and loving always. God bless you, Jane. Now, let us couple the future of England with the past of England. The glories and victories and triumphs that are over. And the sorrows that are over, too. Let's drink to our sons who made part of the pattern. And to our hearts that died with them. Let's drink to the spirit of gallantry that made a strange heaven out of unbelievable hell. And let's drink to the hope that one day, this country of ours, which we love so much, will find dignity and greatness and peace again. Robert Marshall and Madeline Carroll have a word for us in a few moments. But now, a curtain slowly falls. The cavalcade is gone. Gone to the home of straight ascending smoke, of distant melodies, of white sails that vanish on a red horizon. Gone to the home of all brave things that flourish, fade and disappear to live again in memories. To England I give thanks. Thanks for showing the world how to muddle through 
Thanks for her patriots and poets, for roast beef and plum pudding, for Trafalgar and tobacco, for kippers and kipling, for bowler hats and bowling on the green, and for performers like Madeline Carroll and Herbert Marshall, who now rejoin us. Miss Carroll, Mr. Marshall. Many thanks, Mr. DeMille. And to paraphrase the words of Gilbert and Sullivan's Mr. Gilbert, I might have been a Russian, a Frenchman, Turk, or Prussian, or perhaps Italian, but in spite of all temptations to belong to other nations, I remain an English man. <laughs> then perhaps you or Bart can tell me why it is that only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the noonday sun. I refer to you, Mr. Marshall. You're putting me nicely on the spot. <laughs> I can't answer that, Mr. DeBille, but I can tell you what happened when a mad dog bit an Englishman. <laughs> That's hardly news, Bart. But go right ahead. It's a tale related by another English poet, Oliver Goldsmith, and runs something like this. The dog and man at first were friends, but when a peak began, the dog, to gain some private ends, went mad and bit the man. The wound, it seemed, both sore and sad to every Christian eye. And while they swore the dog was mad, they swore the man would die. But soon a wonder came to light that showed the rogues they lied. The man recovered of the bite. The dog it was that died. <laughs> <laughs> Proving perhaps that all Englishmen should be muzzled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but before that happens to me, I want to add just a word of appreciation of Lux Toilet Soap. To me, it's just as important in my dressing room as a mirror. It's really an international beauty care. For in England, too, actresses turn to Lux Soap for keeping complexions of their loveliest just as we do here in Hollywood. In fact, I was using Lux Toilet Soap when I was teaching school. So you can see we're friends of long standing. I want to thank you too, Mr. DeMille, for the opportunity to play Robert Marriott in what I think is one of the greatest dramas of our generation. Plays like this are characteristic of the Lux Radio Theater and bring to the air a dignity and prestige equaling the highest traditions of the legitimate stage. Cavalcade is a play for the new year. Perhaps it's neither my place nor my talent to stand here and deliver a message. Cavalcade can do it so much better. Yet, how splendid a thing is love of fellow men, of country and of peace. A few days more, and in Hollywood, in Times Square, in London, and in all their counterparts the world over, there will be a sound of bells and celebration. Let's hope that when they ring again in another 12 months... They'll echo through a world a little closer to understanding itself. A little more tolerant. A little nearer to the truth that it is a good old world. And they serve their country best. Who serve the cause of peace. Good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, and thanks to you both. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Roick. Mr. Marshall appeared through courtesy of RKO Studios and Columbia Pictures. Miss Carroll through Walter Wanger Productions. I refer you now to Mr. DeMille. Your season ticket in the Lux Radio Theater is renewed next Monday night when we salute 1937 by starring Spencer Tracy, Virginia Bruce, and Francis Farmer. Our play is one with, which met with tremendous enthusiasm on both stage and screen. The Pulitzer Prize play, Men in White. We shall hear Mr. Tracy in the role of Dr. George Ferguson in turn. Miss Farmer as Barbara Denon and Miss Bruce as Laura Hudson, the girl whose love stands between Ferguson and his profession in this gripping story of clashing loyalties. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Spencer Tracy, Virginia Bruce, and Francis Farmer in Men in White. High over Asia, the sun is racing westward emblazoning the final days of a departing year. But a new sun shall rise with the new year. And may it make a brighter world for you. This is Cecil B. DeMille, wishing you a glorious new year from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.